Okay, so now we're live. Um, one quick thing I wanted to do um, just to kind of kick us off this morning is um, last time when we were doing the turtle polygon thing, we did all the math and we kind of figured out how to do it. And uh, we ended up realizing that we maybe made the wrong choice in terms of which variable to specify. So what was the problem we ran into when we made like a really big polygon with edge length of say 10? What happened? Yeah, it went off the screen and of course that meant that the turtle method, the package basically croaked because it doesn't support doing things off of the screen. Um, and that happened, like we only noticed it when we did a very large number of sides. Okay, but you know, whatever. So we said we could have recoded it to define the radius instead and compute the edge length in terms of the radius rather than the radius in terms of the edge length. Basically, it just means, you know, solving this equation for D instead of R. That's not rocket science to do. Um, so anyway, I went ahead and did that, and here it is. Okay, so uh, this time we specify the radius rather than the, the end, the number of sides. And then we compute the edge length as a function of it, and it's just, you know, solving the equation the other direction um, instead of the way that we, we had done originally. Okay, so no big deal there, uh, but I just wanted to show you that, that I had done so. Um, and then we can kind of see it in action. So uh, here I'm doing a 50 sided polygon, and it looks as close enough to a circle for government work as, as we could care to. Uh, care to, to do, okay? Um, and, uh, you know, we can use this, so for example, the if you look in the glossary uh, of the turtle methods or in the documentation for the turtle class, which is part of the, the main Python documentation, uh, there are options, so for example, here the turtle is drawn with an arrowhead and that's the default unless you specify otherwise. There doesn't have to be an actual thing there. Right. Um, also, you saw how it was kind of animating drawing the circle. You can adjust the speed at which that happens um, to be really slow or really fast as you see fit. Um, and uh, you, so, yeah, you can turn the this on or off. Uh, the other thing that you can do is uh, in our case, we had. Um, we had the turtle move forward based on the radius, but not actually draw anything. Um, you can also specify just directly the X and Y coordinates of the, the turtle, right? So in this case, we didn't do it that way. We just moved it starting at the origin, but you do have that option if you, if you so choose. Um, so, you know, think of, think of that when you guys are doing the make something cool with turtles assignment. Um, and, uh, you know, there's also options to change the thickness of the line or the color of it or whatever. So just come up with something fun. Um, and uh, it, it better be cool. But what, how do I, def what's the definition of cool? Never heard that before. Uh, no, okay, never heard that before. But what's cooler than being cool? Ice cold, right? You guys know that song, right? No? You've all heard it. It's, um, hey, hey, yeah, hey, yeah, yeah. Uh, who, what was the artist? Um, um, yeah, you, you've all heard it, okay. Um, yes. Oh yeah, sure. Yeah. So all I did was solve that equation. It's the same equation, right? Uh, but I just solved it for R instead of D. And so instead of dividing by that trigonometric term, I'm going to be multiplying by it instead because it's just moving it over to the other side of the equation. So, um, yeah. Uh, actually, on the subject, there you see how we had to change our angles into. Or uh, uh, for the purposes of doing the sine function, we had to use radian measure for the angles. 
Um, the turtle function or the turtle library actually does support using radians as the angle unit rather than degrees. And there's a function that you can basically specify, hey, measure in radians rather than degrees, and then we wouldn't have had to do that conversion. Um, but it defaults to degrees. So, um, and I don't know, maybe, I, I think for drawing shapes and doing geometry, it's probably easier for you guys to think of degrees. Um, and for doing calculus is kind of when I want to think in radians. Otherwise, I just convert. Um, yeah, so, uh, okay. So any quick questions about that? That's just a, a quick update. Um, oh, also on the uh, uh, Canvas, two things. One, did I do I have a link to my to the GitHub repository on Canvas? No. Okay, I will put that there after class. Um, so everything that we do in class on or that I'm programming on here, I sync online to a GitHub repo, and uh, I'll give you guys a link so you can get to any of the example code. Um, and every time, uh, every class, or when I'm working on st stuff in the office. I synchronize it, and that way all the code is the same everywhere, and uh, it'll always be up to date. Okay. Um, okay. Uh, the other thing about Canvas that I wanted to mention is, uh, so you know how some of you guys are having trouble with the readings not passing the score back to Canvas? I think we figured out why. So what you have to do is, you know, you can't just go to the RuneStone website and then read the chapter. You've got to actually click on the assignment in Canvas that takes you to the chapter and do it all there. If you access it sort of outside, I don't think it's correctly keeping track of the progress, and so that's the problem. Now, for the assignments up until this point, don't worry about it. I'll just copy and paste or whatever and deal with it manually. But moving forward, try and do it. Always click on the assignment in Canvas to launch it. Okay, question. And it still isn't doing it. Okay, well then maybe there's, of course, something else. So uh, that was one thing that their tech people suggested. So um, yes, that's the other thing that you should just, if you access the page, it should complete. Okay, of course, because um, it's and, and you're not the only one. It's it's doing that for. It seemed to work fine for chapter one, but not the other ones. So yeah. Yeah, now Mark, at the bottom of the glossary, was there a little button that said Mark is complete? No, okay, and that's the problem. There should be, yes, you're right. Um, so I think what I'll do is just in the future, I'll stop assigning the glossary page as part of the assignment, and that hopefully will fix that moving forward. But um, yeah, okay, good. All right, so what I wanted to talk to about today is a bit more about modules and then also really hammer uh, the idea of functions. So uh, the turtle package module, whatever, I mean, doesn't matter what word we use for it, uh, you can really think of it, it's, it's also Python code. It's just a big pile of it and we don't know what's there, okay? We, we do know by virtue of what the documentation is, how to use things that are built into it. And if we dug around, I'm sure we could find the actual Python code for it. But uh, for our purposes, at least right now, we don't really care. It's just a black box that's got code inside of it, okay? And modules are precisely that. They're just Python code, that's it. Um, and you can use things out of them without having to actually see the code inside, or you could actually see the code inside because, well, maybe you actually wrote it, okay? So what this allows us to do is to modularize our uh, code a little bit, and if we want to, uh, you know, so say for example, the math library, right? Uh, that's gonna have tons and tons of trigonometry and other kind of calculating things in there, uh, we don't need to always have that code like copied and pasted into our program. We can just import from the library and the library can be some separate thing that somebody else deals with, okay? And then you as the programmer learn how to interface with that module by basically reading its documentation. Um, okay, 
So uh, for the turtle or the math library, um, we're using a library as a black box, but it doesn't have to be, okay? Uh, it, it's really just a chunk of Python code. So, uh, right, so we'll have a transparent box here soon instead of a black one. Uh, okay, so the, um, what I wanted to do was sort of uh, show you how this could work. Um, and so what I'll do is I'm going to make a new file here, and I'm going to call this our, um, let's say, turtle class package.py. Okay, and it's not going to have anything in it uh, yet, but <clears throat> we'll put some stuff there. Okay, and what we can put here could just be in you know regular old boring Python code, but it can also include defining objects. Okay, which the turtle package does because it defines what a turtle is, um, and it can also define functions, which would be, uh, well, really anything. Okay. Um, so I'm going to back up a moment, and I want to kind of talk, uh, I'm going to sketch this out on the iPad, and talk about what a function actually is, and maybe what it also isn't. Okay, so is that okay? All right, and then we'll come back and actually program some stuff. Okay, so um, what is a function? Right, okay, and so that's probably the, the sense in which you first think of it is in terms of its mathematical uh, definition, okay? And so in math, we say that a function is something that goes from a domain to a range, and you say, you know, um, that for a given input x, there can be at most one y satisfying f of x equals y. So you can't get two answers out of a function for a given input. Okay. Um, graphically, how did you tell that this was the case in uh, calculus or in, in algebra or calculus? Right, so you guys remember the vertical line test? That, if it passes the vertical line test, you've got a graph of a function. Um, if it fails, then it's not a function or it didn't come from a function. Okay, so that's the way that we define a function in math. And, um, but we can be slightly more general with the idea in terms of computer science. Because a function need not have any inputs and need not return anything. Okay, so in math, whenever you talk about a function, you think of, well, usually they involve numbers, right? f of x equals x squared. So what kind of things go into that function? Numbers of some sort, okay, real numbers probably. Uh, what kind of thing comes out of that function? Some other real number, or in the case of x squared, it would be non-negative, just because that's what squaring does. Okay, but not things come in, things come out. Um, and I can't think of an example where you guys would have done this in math up until this point, where a function doesn't have to have an input or an output. Okay, it can be such a thing, um, but probably here in CS is the first time that you actually encounter this idea. Okay, so a function can have no inputs and no outputs and just does stuff. You can almost think of it as a shorthand. Yeah. Uh, yeah, okay, so the quit function, like if you open up a Python terminal and you type quit parentheses and there's nothing inside the parentheses, well, that tells you there's no input to the quit function. 
And does the quit function return a value? Uh, probably not really. So there's also no return, okay? Um, now, often these things do have inputs and return values, but they don't have to, okay? So, for example, let's suppose that we have um, uh, our Python, or sorry, our turtle uh, polygon thing that we just wrote. We can turn that into a function, okay? And the input for it would be what? Well, I need to specify the number of sides and the radius, and possibly also which turtle do I want to actually draw the picture. Okay, good. Um, and uh, although I could avoid that, and we'll, we'll, we'll look at that in a moment. So I need to specify several pieces of information. And in calculus, or sorry, in math class, we tend to make the functions only take in one value, right? They're functions of a single variable, but is there any real reason they have to be that way? That they only take in a single number? No, it's just that the reason that we only, well, most of the time restrict ourselves to only doing single variable in a course like say calculus is because doing calculus with more than one variable is really exciting but you have to do it with one variable before you can do it with more than one, okay? Uh, so most of multivariable calculus is just like Calc 1, but with more letters, right? It's like on the cereal box, right? When it's like, now with more marshmallows, right? Calculus, now with more letters. Um, now, would you buy that cereal? You don't eat cereal? Okay. Uh, well, okay, so we'll have our, our, our dad joke for the day. What's, um, what's a mathematician's favorite brand of vodka? Huh? Absolute vodka. No. No. No good. Okay, anyway. Um, I know that was bad. Okay, so, like, yeah, like I said, in math, um, t it, at least in calculus or the first course in calculus, the functions only accept one input value and it's generally a number of some sort, okay? We can be a little bit more general in our thinking here to a function can accept a number, it can accept strings, it can accept booleans, it can accept any data type, and that could even include a turtle. A turtle is an object I can give it to a function to do something with, just like I can a number, right? Uh, okay, so let's take, um, let's go back to the computer and let's take basically our uh, turtle polygon with the radius, okay? And essentially all I'm gonna do is copy and paste this whole thing, okay? And then I'm gonna go in here to our package and I'm going to add a few things. Okay, the first is, and, and I'm also gonna remove a few things. I'm gonna remove the import turtle because that will already get imported when we use this function. Okay, so we, we don't need to do it twice, basically. Uh, but I'm gonna leave the import math and we'll see why in a moment. Okay, so um, the next thing I need to do is I need to say that I'm defining a function. I need to choose a name for this function and I also need to think about, well, what inputs does this function have, okay? So if I want my function to draw a polygon with a given radius using a given turtle, then what pieces of information do I need to specify? The radius. I don't need to specify the edge length because I can compute that in terms of the radius, but I do need to specify the turtle and the number of sides, okay? So my function here, uh, first off, what do we want to call this? Let's call it turtle draw polygon, okay? Um, and what did we say it needs to, to use? It needs to have a radius. It needs to have a a number of sides and it needs to have what a turtle okay 
and um, I'm going to call the turtle the turtle. Okay, for reasons that will become clear in a minute. Okay, so the syntax here is def function name, and then in the parentheses would be the list of the different inputs that this function takes. Uh, the order of them is up to you, but once you choose an order, you have to stick with that order. Okay, so there's no reason that I had to put these things in the order I did. That's just the order we chose. Okay, the next thing I need to do is take all of the other code and I need to tab it over uh, one tabbing. Okay, so I just selected all of it and hit tab and it moved it all over. Okay? Because it is now part of this function and so the tabbing is how I know what is inside the function. Yes. About to get to that, yes. Um, num sides is 50. That's hard coding. So I need to delete this because the num sides is going to come in as an input to the function. So I don't need to specify it. Same thing with the radius. Okay. But I do need to still know what the angle is. So I've computed that. Okay, good. Um, and then edge, uh, we can print the edge and stuff. Now down here, do I need to define a screen inside this function? No, because the screen will already exist when I call the function. I also am not going to have to define a turtle because he'll already be in existence before I call this function. Okay, but what is the turtle name within this function? The turtle. Okay, so everywhere I see Alex, I'm going to replace it with the turtle. Okay, and when we call, so think of the turtle as a generic name. Uh, uh, you could. But the reason I'm choosing to not do that is because Alex will be the name of my turtle, but I will define him externally to the function. So his existence has nothing to do with the function. And then I will pass him to the function. And what Python will do is everywhere it says sees the turtle, it will replace it with the actual turtle that I give it. So like I said, think of the turtle right now as just a generic placeholder for whichever turtle is doing this. Okay. Now the reason that I want to do it that way is because let's suppose that I want a program where there are five turtles and maybe all five turtles are drawing different polygons. Well, maybe the, the Alex is going to draw this polygon, but Bob is going to draw that polygon. Okay. So I can have multiple turtles and, but only one placeholder name, right? So, Think of maybe another way to think about this is it's kind of like how we use x in math class, right? When I say f of x equals x squared, um, like x is just, you, you don't know what it is, right? It's only if I you plug in a specific value, oh, I want f of 2, like 2 is the actual object. And where does it go? Everywhere you see x, right? It's sort of a, x is a placeholder in that sense. Okay, but same idea. Okay. Um, okay, so does that make sense? Okay, and then there's one other thing that we've got to delete, which is down at the bottom, um, and which is we don't also we don't need the turtle dot done because we'll put that in our main uh, program. Okay. So um, okay, is that okay? So basically, it's just a copy and paste job, and then we deleted a few things. Okay, so now I need a, uh, uh, I need to actually call this function. So think of this chunk of code as just a really, really long way or long-winded way of saying something like f of x equals x squared, right? f of x equals x squared defines a function. But have we ever actually used the that function? Not yet. Okay. So uh, we want to actually do something that's going to use this function. 
Okay, does that make sense? All right, so let me create a new file and I'll call this, um, let's call it turtle test2. Okay, and we'll save it in the uh, same directory as everything else, okay? And here I need to import turtle like before. Um, I won't do import math here, uh, although I can. I'll, I'll just go ahead and do it um, for uh, funsies. And then um, we need to do the stuff that we would otherwise, which is we need to set up a screen. Okay, and then what was it, uh, turtle.done at the end that we need? Okay, good. All right, so that's just the sort of shell that we already had for our uh, actual program. And then if I want to actually use this function, I need to import the, the turtle class package. Okay, and the way I'm going to do this is I'm going to say from turtle class package, if I could spell, import star. Okay, I could also just do import turtle class package, but I've deliberately chosen this way of doing it um, to, um, uh, to explain one thing. So uh, a package can have a lot of stuff in it, and maybe you need all of the stuff in it, and maybe you don't. Right. So, for example, what out of the math package have we actually used in our program? Just the sign function. Uh, well, yeah, okay, and pi. So, did I need the rest of the math package? Not in the case of this program. So, if you import things using that kind of lingo from something import stuff, you can actually specify to only import the pieces of the package you need. So, for example, if I only needed the sign function or the pi value, I could import those and only those pieces of it and forget about cosine and arctangent and logarithms and other stuff that I may not need in my program. Um, now, why might that be a good thing to be able to import only parts, the needed parts of a package, yeah? And memory. Yeah, it's going to save on processing time and, and mostly memory. Because why load a bunch of stuff into memory that you're not going to use? Okay. Now, for a simple program like the stuff we're going to be writing here, does it really matter? No, it's, it's not going to matter whatsoever. Um, but if you're trying to do some really, really big, sophisticated thing, uh, then it could actually matter. And, yeah, use the other door if you need to. Oh, the garbage. Yeah, okay, sorry. Yeah, like, um, I really like how they redid the classroom, uh, with the exception of the fact that, like, I don't know about you guys, but this seems like a pretty glaring fire code violation, you know? Um, so, yeah, anyway. Um, okay, so, uh, yeah, so you can import just pieces of, of a package as needed. Um, and, you know, for this, it's not really going to worry, uh, make much difference. So what this will tell Python is that, hey, there's some stuff in this file that we called the uh, turtle class package, and go out and get that and incorporate it as part of our program. So then what I can do is I can say, well, let's define Alex as a turtle. Okay, so now Alex has come into existence and then I can tell uh, Alex, hey, go out into that function and make me a polygon. Okay, so what did I call my function? Uh, turtle draw polygon. Okay, and what do I need to specify? Well, um, I need to specify a radius. Okay, what radius do we want? All right, let's just do 100. That's what we did before, as sake of example. Num sides, let's do like, say, 10. Um, and which turtle is going to draw this? Alex. Okay. Okay, good. 
All right, so if we run this, what should we see? A 10-sided polygon that's being drawn by Alex, okay? And let's see. Looks pretty good, huh? Okay, so what we did, right, fundamentally is we just sort of took our polygon code and by turning it into a function, we can reuse it and have, maybe Alex is going to draw multiple polygons, right? In fact, could we just copy and paste this line and do it again? Right, so what should happen now? You should draw two polygons, but something interesting will happen. Ah, why did that happen? Yeah. Yeah, exactly. Our function was built assuming that the turtle starts at the origin. And uh, we moved the turtle over to get to the edge of the polygon before we drew it. But did we ever move him back to the origin? No. Okay. Another way of thinking about this would be, uh, would it maybe be a good idea to modify our function to specify also where the turtle should be when we, like where the center of the polygon should be? Could we add that as an input variable or variables either way? Okay. Yeah, we could, right? Because right now, uh, our function assumes that he starts at the origin. And so why did that second polygon get drawn to the right of the first one? Because where was the where was Alex at the end of the first polygon? Where did he finish? He finished here, which is not at the origin, right? But it is the point where the second polygon is centered. Okay, does that make sense? So we could doctor up the function to, to fix that, but we have to actually go through and doctor it up a little bit. Okay, does that make sense? Um, the other thing we could do is, well, if Alex can draw polygons and we have another turtle, say Bob, right, can we have Bob draw polygons too? Sure. Okay. Um, okay, so uh, when you, uh, let, let, me, let me give the following um, caveats. For the make something cool assignment, don't define functions. So you can if you want, but that was not the intent, right? Just make something cool without defining functions and modules. Um, and then later you'll modular, modularize blah, 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 some stuff. Okay, does that make sense? Okay. Okay. Um, so I want to point out one uh, sort of very important thing about functions. So what, in addition to we getting, uh, us getting stuff drawn on the screen, great, uh, it's also printed some, some information down to the console, okay? What information got printed? In this case, it was the radius and the edge length, uh, and it got printed twice because we called the function that drew the polygons twice. Does that make sense? Okay, so wonderful. Um, let me go back and what did we call the, um, those variables? Well, we had angle and we had edge, okay? Um, and then we can print whatever we want to print. Uh, let me go back to the main function here. And let me just, for sake of demonstration, let me remove our second polygon. Um, what would happen if I printed edge? Any ideas as to what might happen? Would you expect to see the number 61.8 blah, blah, blah get printed twice, once by the function and once after the polygon is finished drawing? Would you guys expect that? How many of you expect that? None of you are falling for the trap. Okay, what do the rest of you expect? In silence, I'm going to cast mute on you again. Huh? Safal. Error. error. Why am I going to get an error? 
Exactly. Okay. And so this illustrates a concept called scope. So let me run this to demonstrate it. Okay. So it ran the polygon drawing, but where did the error occur? After at line 10. Okay. So the reason that this happened is the variable edge its existence is only within the function, not outside the function. Okay, does that make sense? So what does that mean in terms of variables? If you want to have sub-variables or temporary things that are defined in terms of a, inside a function, they can have the same name, right? So for example, um, Let's say that I wanted to write another function that drew stars with a given number of sides or points or whatever. Could I also use the variable called edge there? Yes, without consequence. Okay. Now, what happens, though, if I said something like this? Okay, what is going to happen this time? It prints, right? Okay, because here edge exists within our main program, and this is the part that's going to drive you guys bonkers. But what did the function print for edge? 61 point whatever. Okay, was that the correct number? Yeah. But then it printed 5. Did I ever say that edge was 5 after I drew the polygon? Okay, so this is where this is really going to give you guys sort of a, a aneurysm. Edge, there are two edges. One is inside the function and has its value, and the other is outside the function and has its other value. Okay, now, does that drive you insane? Maybe. So what would maybe be a bad idea is to do this, okay? If you use edge as a variable within a function, don't also use it as a variable outside of a function because otherwise you're going to drive yourself crazy, okay? Yeah. Yes. Okay, so now my IDE, you'll notice it's not giving me any error or any warning uh, that it's doing that. And in fact, when I ran the program, Python also did not give me any warning um, that that is a bad idea. Okay, so even though it's legal, it's not a good move. Okay, now in some programming languages, it is outright illegal. Okay, so for example, in C or something, like don't, do not do this. So the, um, wh what this means is some variables are within scope of a function and only within that function. So scope is the magic word that we use for this. So for example, the angle or the edge, right, uh, only exist within the function. And if you exit that function, they're just gone, right? But that's okay. If you exit the function, they're no longer needed. Uh, if you need to save that data somehow, then you need to define it outside the function and pass it to the function for doing things with. And both things are appropriate to do. Sometimes you want it inside the function, local. Other times you want it broader than that, which we'll call global for right now. Okay. And just uh, like we kind of talked about last time, think before you code. And then you'll save yourself this trouble. Okay. Um, Okay, so good. Okay, so you guys, do we understand why the edge, using edge in two different contexts is a bad move? Okay, the other thing that will drive you guys crazy is you could say, oh, well, I'll just have uppercase edge here and lowercase edge there. Still also a bad idea. Okay, uh, so, so don't do that. It's bad. Okay. Um, and then, of course, if I remove that, then I can no longer print edge here. Okay. 
Um, okay, so any questions so far? Yes. Uh, sure. Here. And if I need to scroll up or down, just let me know. Okay, so basically that's doing everything that the original polygon function did, just with a few minor tweaks. Okay. Good? Yeah? All right. So the, uh, the next kind of stuff I wanted to talk about was um, Booleans and also unit testing. Okay. Um, and, and we'll kind of see what uh, those are here for a second. Okay, so let me, um, any questions on the turtle stuff before we move on to new examples? Good? Okay, so um, let me make a new folder here. And let me call this um, unit testing. And let me copy this to the main folder. Um, why is this not? There we go. Okay. Oh, yeah, you're fine. I mean, I wouldn't want to sit next to those two either. So, especially with that hair. JT. Yeah. So, okay. So I'm going to make a new folder called unit testing and let's just make a new file unit testing one.py. Okay. Nothing particularly special here. Um, so unit testing is uh, a way that you can um, do some automated testing of programs. So for something like the drawing of polygons and whatnot, like you just need to run it and see what you get. But if you're programming a function or something, and particularly if it's something that's going to be uh, working with numeric data, you could, if you know what the answers are supposed to be, and you're just trying to make sure that the program actually matches what it's supposed to give, then you can use this as sort of an automated way of testing it. Now, from my standpoint as an instructor, or maybe if some of you guys end up as teachers one day, you can also use this to automatically uh, do automated testing on student code. So for example, let's say that I had to all write a function that computed um, an approximation to square roots using some particular method, okay? Um, not using the built-in math functions. And then I wanna test y'all's code on a gajillion different inputs I could randomly define a thousand numbers, pipe it through your code, and have it tell me whether or not it passed all thousand random tests. And if it did, then what could I safely assume about your code? It's fine, okay? This is particularly key when you do randomized stuff because then you guys can't like, like, so for example, uh, could you guys guess, like, what am I testing your uh, mortgage cal or your car loan calculators on? 55,000 dollars, five percent interest, five years, right? And why do, why am I testing them all with that number? Because I remember what the answers are supposed to be, right? Well, if I pre-compute what the, like, I write my own functions and then I'm checking if your functions match my functions, then you're good, okay? Um, yeah, so, uh, but how we do that, or maybe the, the beginning of how we do it, is with this statement called an assert, okay? So, um, if I take, and I'll just use a quick example here, um, what is the type of 9 divided by 5? It's a float, right? Okay, and so I know that that's a float. And so I can assert that that is equal to float. Okay? All right. That is a true statement. 
And if I run this code, it appears that nothing happened. Okay? All right, now, let's deliberately make this statement false. How could I make this statement false? Uh, say again? Yeah, I could, for example, change this to be of type int instead of float. We know that 9 divided by 5 is, oops, sorry, that's autocorrect there. Okay, this is a false statement. And so if I run it, it will get assertion error, and it will basically error out. Okay, so uh, now there are actually some nice packages for doing automated testing that are a little bit more fancy, but this is sort of the most basic way that you could do it. Okay, uh, is is with the, an assert. Okay, so um, there's how what's one way I could fix it without changing the word int? Okay, nine divided by five. What could I change that to? I could do five divided by five, but that's still a float. Actually, it's just one point zero. Uh, okay, I could do doesn't equal, or I could do nine int divide five. Okay, so remember, and this this actually is a good reminder. What's the difference between division and integer division? The syntax is regular division is a single slash, and integer only division is double slash. Okay, and so integer only division. What's nine divided by five? One. Okay. Remainder four would be how we would say it elementary school style, but yeah, one, okay? Whereas nine divided by five uh, floating point wise is what? 1.8000 and so on, okay? Great. Uh, okay, so I can do testing this way um, and see, you know, do I get what I'm supposed to get kind of thing. So another thing I could do is, so let me change this back to float so that it won't croak. Um, let's actually, just for the sake of uh, doing some math, let's import the math library. And then I could do something like assert um, math.square root of two equals 1.4. Okay, is that true? No. Is 1.4 the square root of 2? It's close, but not close enough. Okay, so here it's going to assert an error because, and even if I uh, add, you know, however many digits that I want, it's still going to assert an error. Okay, so that may not look particularly useful uh, because what I would have to do basically is, well, let me just compute what is the square root of 2. Um, all right, so 1.414214315624. Let's see if that is sufficient. Okay. Uh, still an error. So you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to open up Mathematica and I'm going to get even more digits. Once Mathematica decides to load. Okay, so to 30 decimal places, huh, that's weird, Mathematica is being really slow. Okay, there we go. All right, let's see. 62373095048. All right, let's try that just out of curiosity. Okay, now it works. That was sufficient. Okay, so uh, the we'd have to go to the precision of the floating point standard, uh, which in this case is um, 
I I'm, don't remember if, if Python uses 64-bit or 32-bit internally, but I'll, I'll double check that. Okay. Um, okay, so in this case, like, that's maybe not really helpful because would I be all right with 1.4142 probably? It depends on the context, right? Um, but I might be okay with a lesser precision than that many decimal points and still be happy with whatever the function is. Um, okay, so uh, great. So let's come back to the um, what fundamentally is the statement math.square root equals blah, 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 or type of whatever equals float. Okay, those are statements. What kind of statement is it? It's sort of conditional. I wouldn't call it conditional. But you're in the right, you're thinking in the right direction. Okay, these are Boolean expressions. Okay, so what is a Boolean expression? It's anything that evaluates to either true or false. Okay, so Boole, uh, George Boole, has anybody ever heard of this guy? No, mathematician from the early 19th century, did a lot of stuff in mathematical logic and whatnot. Um, so anyway, um, so a Boolean expression is like I said, anything that evaluates to true or false. Okay, so looking at type nine over five double equals floats, okay, I've got double equals. Have we ever actually used double equals before? Maybe in one case, I don't remember. Well, you have to there, yes. Okay, you have to use Booleans anytime you're making conditionals or looping type structures, okay, because with a conditional, like if I say, um, actually, this is maybe a good dad joke. Um, go to the store and buy a dozen eggs. Right? If they have apples, buy 20. Okay, what you, would you expect to come home with? 20 eggs or a dozen eggs and 20 apples? Right, depends on how you interpret that, right? But yeah, or 32 eggs, right? That may be the last thing, right? So yes, if you send a logician or a mathematician to the store, right, if they have apples, buy 20. Yeah, lather, rinse, repeat. You, you know, all shampoo bottles are single usage, right? So, um, yes, okay. So, um, so anytime you want to make a statement that's of the form if, then, you need to have a condition, okay, that determines whether or not you do or do not do the if statement, right? So in the case of our cheesy grocery store thing, if they have apples, buy 20. Well, what happens if you get to the store and there are no apples in sight? Well, then you're not gonna buy 20, whatever that means, okay? Um, so, but the condition under which you're deciding whether or not to purchase things, that buy 20, whatever that means, is predicated on a statement the truth or falsehood of a Boolean statement, okay? So, Booleans, one type of Boolean expression is an equality, okay? Now, in, we've used single equals before, right? And in math, we use equals in two different ways, right? I could say, let x equal five, or I could say, x squared minus three x plus four equals zero, solve for x. Right, so the, the equal symbol in those two contexts means something different. And you guys just know this difference because you're not morons and you're, you know, well-thinking humans uh, and you've been doing math for 
most of your conscious life. What, however, is a computer? The world's fastest moron, right? It can follow every instruction you give it to the letter and do it really, really, really fast. But what can't it do? Understand context, okay? And so because of that, in pretty much every programming language I can think of, um, if you want to assert, like basically uh, give a value to a variable, assign a value to something, you use single equal. And if you want to check or you're asking the question, is it true that something is equal to something else, you use double equal. Okay, does that make sense? Yes? Okay. Um, by the way, then, this is yet another reason why you don't program after midnight, because you'll screw up the equals in some case. Okay. Okay, so other things that are Boolean expressions um, would be, uh, we can also do compound expressions. Okay, so for example, um, let's suppose that I wanted to program the thermostat in my house. Okay, I've got, say, some fancy computer-controlled thing. Well, maybe I want to program my thermostat to never allow the temperature in the house to get above a certain point and below some other certain point, right? I don't want it to ever get below, say, um, well, okay, let me work in Celsius just because that's how my thermostat is set. Like, I never, under any circumstances whatsoever, want it to get below 10 Celsius, okay, which is pretty cold, right? I would not want that if I'm inside the house, okay? But, like, from a safety standpoint, uh, let's say, um, let me just use, let's say I want it to stay between 18 and 25 Celsius, okay? Seem reasonable? 18 is, like, mid, mid to upper 60s, and 25 is, like, 77 or 78, somewhere in there, right? Seems like a reasonable temperature to keep your house. Okay, so what would happen if the temperature is outside of that range? What would I do? Yes, I would do house dot explode parentheses, right? So provided that I had defined the explode method for the house object in some package, okay? Um, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a, like, sticks of dynamite under my house, just in case, okay? Yeah. Um, well, but that, that's certainly the method that you would call if you discover a spider, right? Um, then, then the only solution is to nuke the whole thing from orbit, right? You can never be sure. Um, okay, so, um, yeah, joking aside, right, what would I do if the temperature exceeded uh, 25 Celsius? What would I probably do? Yeah, turn on the AC, and if the temperature was below 18, I turn on the heater. Okay, in some sort of, uh, uh, you know, I, yeah. Okay, so and if the temperature is between those two things, I wouldn't do anything. I'm good. Okay, so let's take here. Um, let me just say temperature equals, uh, for sake of demonstration, let me just define it to be 30 for right now, okay? And if I had, say, if temperature is greater than 25, and I'll just print here, turning on AC, and say if the temperature is less than 18, I'll print turning on heater. Okay. Yay. So what's going to happen if I run this uh, at this point? What do we expect? It's going to say turning on AC because the 30 is bigger than 25. Okay. Um, and if I change the temperature to, let's say, 15, it would say turning on heater instead. Okay, great. 
What would happen if the temperature was, say, 20 degrees? What would happen? Well, right now, what would happen? Nothing. Right? Because Would it print turning on AC or turning on heater? No, it wouldn't. Okay. Um, yes. Oh, let's say I changed it to 20. Yeah, yeah, no, no. The, good point. Yeah. So I change it to 20. Then what happens? Absolutely nothing. Okay. So maybe I would want to have something like this. Okay, now one thing that I've uh, found in my practice in programming is use an extra set of parentheses. Okay, what word do I need to put in between here? I need to put the word and. Sometimes I would put the word or. Okay, but the word and or not, those are also Boolean expressions, right? And so what does and of two things mean? It's true whenever both pieces are true or is true when one or the other or possibly both are true. Not is true whenever the thing you give it is false and vice versa. Uh, are there other Boolean functions? Huh? That's not Boolean. The wild part isn't. You would have a condition that is Boolean, but um, yes, exclusive or, nor, nand, and inxor, although it's rare that you actually need these in programming. Um, yeah, so uh, and and or and not are probably the three most common ones, and you can build all the others out of those if you have to. Um, so, yeah. So what, what might be maybe a minor issue here? Okay. Well, is it possible for the temperature to be less than 25 and greater than 18? Yeah, totally, right? There's a lot of numbers that satisfy that. Okay. And so, uh, but what about if the temperature is exactly 18 degrees? Nothing will happen because we haven't correctly uh, realized that what's the opposite of being less than 18? Greater than or equal. Okay, so where I've typed the greater than here on line 15 or the less than for the less than 25, what should I change those to? In math, what do we have? We got the greater than or equal symbol. Uh, do you know where that key is in your keyboard? No. So you can do greater than or equal to and uh, why is it erroring? Oh, yeah. Okay. Because, yeah, because it's a conditional, yeah. So, okay. So I fixed that by, uh, well, using my head, right, that I needed to, you know, change the inequality symbol slightly. Okay. Uh, now, this, of course, is kind of a silly example, but eh, it's a good example. Um, but in the case of when you have multiple conditionals, Right, there are other ways to do this. Okay, so what would be the opposite of the temperature being greater than 25? It's less than 25, right? And often you want to make a decision based on that only. Now, what complicated this example was the fact that we wanted to be greater than one thing and less than another. Okay, so let me rewrite this in a different manner that maybe is a little bit more clean. Okay, so I could say if, so I'm gonna keep this.
Okay, so let me uh, get rid of the terminal and scroll so that you can see the whole thing. Okay, so what I want to do is I want to think of, let me put an extra space here. So this is, and the stuff up here is the old version. Okay, so um, let's look at both of those two things. And first off, let's convince ourselves that the function is exactly the same, okay? The temperature, what did I set the temperature variable to be now? Uh, right now it's 30, okay? So what's gonna happen? Yeah, it's gonna print turning on AC because is the temperature within 18 to 25? No, is it greater than 25? Yes, okay. So what I've done here is what's called a compound conditional, okay. The individual, the, the old version are just three regular conditionals, right. If something, do something, okay. Um, so what I have down there on the third, or the new version is I've got an is, an ill, uh, I, blah, blah, blah. sorry, I can't speak. I have an is, uh, damn it. Uh, now I know how actors feel. Have you guys ever seen be real or bloopers of when they're like trying to speak and can't, right? Okay, if, else if, which is abbreviated as elif, okay, and else, okay, I can have as many LCF statements as I want, okay? So, for example, where you might use that would be something like, um, um, let's say, well, actually, here's a good example. Uh, when we do some robotics programming, okay, we'll have a sensor that can tell the color of an object, but only within sort of broad crayon categories. So, like, it can tell the difference between red and orange and yellow and green, but it's not going to know the difference between purple and fuchsia or heliotrope or anything like that, right? So real broad categories, okay? Then I could say, all right, if the color that the object detects is red, do this thing. If it's orange, do that. If it's yellow, do this and so on, okay? That would be a good instance of having a bunch of LF uh, statements, okay? Um, and then in our case, we really only need to have three things. If you're within the range, good. If you're outside the range in one direction, and if neither of those two things are true, then where are you, just logically? Less than uh, 18, which is the else case here. Okay, yeah. Uh, you, on the new version or the old version? Yeah, okay, so you're suggesting that let's change that to an or? Um... Potentially, yeah. So, okay, so you're suggesting let's change this to if temperature is less than 18 or greater than 25. Right. Oh, um, yes, we could have done that. Okay. Uh, yes. So uh, th that's actually maybe a good point. So I think let me type it out and uh, see if this is what you meant. So I could do if um, temperature is less than 18. Uh, print turning turning on AC. LF T 
temperature temperature is greater than 25, or sorry, this would be heater. Print turning on heater. No, AC. Like that? Okay. So uh, are these two things logically equivalent? Yes. Okay. Um, which one's better? Old version, new version, or his version? Well, okay. Yeah, you're a little biased. Well, okay. Can we all agree that the old version is maybe not the best way to have approached this? Okay. For a couple of reasons right, um, using elif and else and kind of compacts it a little bit so that I can see that really these three lines or these three conditions are related to the same question, okay, whereas in the old version, I mean, yeah, I can tell that they're related to the same question, but they may or may not be, okay, um, and then in terms of uh, new version and your version, what's maybe better about doing it that way? It looks neater, and probably the reason it looks neater is because I'm not using the word and, right? I don't have to think as much um, uh, in terms of logic, okay? In terms of execution time, actually, uh, that's also a good thing, right? Now, it, for our purposes here, it's not going to be noticeably slower, but uh, in terms of, like, how machine... Um, instructions gets executed, um, then you still have to make two decisions, um, but the first one with the and, you have to also do logical anding and then make a decision. So, um, yeah, it's, uh, the your version really is a little bit better, okay? Um, but we had to kind of think a little bit logically to come up with the second version, or sorry, the third version, as opposed to the second. But they are both 100% equivalent in terms of actual execution. Okay, and so some of this is going to come down to style, but also just thinking, right? Uh, now, the, the book actually gives some examples of where, like, bad things to do with conditionals would be to have nested conditionals in general. Um, sometimes it makes sense, but you don't want to overdo it. So what do I mean by a nested conditional? An if inside of an if, okay, where it gets tabbed over a bunch. You can do that, and but in general, you want to try to avoid it, because otherwise you're going to get spaghetti code, or you're going to get code where you have to be a Vulcan to think through the logic of it, and realize what the heck's going on. Okay, that was a Star Trek joke, if anybody didn't catch it. Yeah, Vulcans, the pointy ears, and they live by logic. Yeah. Out. Yes. Yes, now go watch all Star Trek. Okay, um, okay. so um, I think that's probably a good place to quit for today. Um, just any kind of broad questions before we kind of wrap this up? Yeah, okay, so what all have we talked about? Uh, let's go in reverse order. Boolean expressions and then how to use them with conditionals. Unit testing just briefly, and we'll revisit that a little bit later. Um, but then where do we spend most of our time talking? Functions, scope of variables, packages, all of that stuff. Okay? All right, stay tuned for more fun and exciting things on Canvas.